speaker needs no introduction. We've heard him, we've seen him, and both Nathaniel and I are excellent. Uh, we're just complete fans of the next person to come on stage. So we'd love to have Naveen Richard on the stage today. Naveen Richard, as you all know, a very professional stand-up comedian, actor, writer, who's been in the Indian comedy industry for over 10 years. He came to know the Lord in April 2020 and has been actively serving in the church and outside of it ever since. We were glad to meet him and to hear a little bit about how that journey came to be. So Naveen, why don't you come take the stage? A big, big, big round of applause. All right, thank you all very much for having me here. What an honor it is to uh, be here amidst such selfless and eminent personalities. Really selfless people, they really gave their lives selflessly. You know, a lot of, a lot of social causes and things like that. So what's a comedian doing here? You know, because I mostly did comedy for myself most of my life, all right? It's mostly for myself. I don't want you guys to feel bad and be like, Navin, don't be so hard on yourself. People need to laugh also. That's what people keep saying. Since yesterday, like, no, Navin, don't feel bad. People need to laugh. So your job is also important. Yeah, people need to laugh, but they don't need to laugh as much as they need brain surgery. All right. So it's not that important. And let me tell you, as much as people need to laugh, there's no comedian that's taking up comedy as some kind of selfless sacrifice. Okay, no comedian has ever said, you know, my real dream is to do agriculture. But I knew that people needed to laugh, so I sacrificed my dreams of ending world hunger and I just started writing jokes. I didn't want to do it, but that was my calling. There, no, no selfless comedian. Sometimes journalists will ask us this, they'll be like, so what, what made you take up this profession? And, and then we say, you know, no, we just like to make people laugh. Like we're some kind of comedy angels going around and doing this for the sake of humanity. So we like to hear other people laughing at our jokes, all right? So then what am I still doing here if I was saved, if I met the Lord a couple of years ago and Jesus said, you know, you need to die to yourselves and you need to put your desires aside and do the Father's will, then what am I still doing, doing stand-up comedy? And I'll, I'll get to that in some time. Now, uh, before that, I probably, I just want to answer this question to those of you who may be wondering, well, you do stand-up comedy. What did you study in college? Um, or which year of college did you drop out in to do stand-up comedy? I'm sorry to disappoint you guys. As you can see, I have many letters after my name. Okay, not just one degree. I have one and a half. That's a BA, LLB. Honors. Does anyone else here have more than one degree? Okay, don't show off. Thank you. Please. Okay, this is a Christian audience here. Please, humble yourself. <laughs> so... And in case you think I'm lying, here's a picture of me with my degree. It's a few times I get to show off my degree, otherwise it's useless. <laughs> I don't know which cupboard I kept it in. But it's there, that's my degree. And I just want to tell you guys, so back when I was in college, I was a pretty motivated guy. If you ask my teachers, they would not have known. They would have been like, he's mostly trying not to sleep in class. Um, but I was motivated. It's just that my motivations were a little directionless, you know. Uh, the reason I took up law is because I thought, Okay, maybe I'll do like environmental law and go and save sea turtles and stuff like that one day. When I found out how much there was to study and how bad I was at studying, I'm like, you know, these sea turtles can save themselves, all right? I'll, I'll go extinct before they do if I keep studying so much. It's stressing me out, right? So, but I didn't quit. In case any of you are wondering, any of the kids are wondering like, oh, Navin quit uh, studies and then he's doing... I did not quit, all right? One of the reasons I didn't quit is because my dad told me, you know, halfway through law college, he said, see, if you quit now and then one day when you want to get married to a girl and you have to face her parents and the parents ask you, what is your educational qualification? What will you, what will you say? I'm like, what kind of motivational talk is this? <laughs> That's my, some hypothetical woman I haven't met, I have to think of her hypothetical parents and what I'm going to say. I didn't quit though. And I'll just tell you a small story of how motivated I was, but I just didn't know what I was supposed to do. I was in my third year of law college and I was writing the law of contracts exam. I remember I studied, you know, I used to study pretty hard and all. And I studied and I wrote the exam as a one page question paper, finished the exam, checked the time, there was 45 minutes left and I thought, oh, this must be a pretty easy, pretty easy uh, exam, right? So then I looked around and I saw everyone else is still writing and I'm like, wait, if this is an easy exam, the good student should have finished before me. Right? But the good students are writing, the bad students are writing, I'm freaking out, I'm thinking, what, did I miss something? So I'm 
looking for more questions. Other people ask for extra answer sheet. I'm thinking maybe I should ask for extra question sheet. <laughs> so I'm thinking, what did I miss? What did I miss? I'm looking around, I see my friend. I was teaching him before the exam. He's writing more than me. I'm like, what are you still writing, dude? I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, maybe I should expand my answer, but I've written one answer, I've drawn a line and then started the next answer, so I can't even expand my answer. So I'm really worrying, I'm like, I can't even do anything, I don't even know how to like expand my answers, I can't do anything, so I just give up, I just put my head down, I looked out the window, I remember I was sitting near the window, I was looking out the window and there was a lawn, this beautiful 10 a.m. sun, these two robins, these two birds were hopping around on the lawn and I remember looking at those birds and just thinking, man, how free they are, dude, they have no worries. Wow, they don't have to study and go for tuition and study second language and all. Like there's no peacock that says you should go for bulbul tuition. You know, it's unnecessary stuff we humans have put on ourselves. I wish I could be like those birds. I suddenly felt so jealous. Has anyone else felt jealous of birds? <laughs> That's how I felt. I was so jealous of these birds and I thought, what, are they, what makes them so free, you know? You know what, they follow their instinct. They do what they're good at. That's what, that's what it is. And I suddenly got hit with this burst of motivation. This is a true story, by the way. I got hit with this burst of motivation. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do what I'm good at. What am I good at? And I started thinking, what am I good at? What is my natural instinct? What is my gifting? And this is what came up in my head. Any guesses? Starts with an S. It's a sandwiches, okay? It's not stand-up comedy. Because <laughs> there was no stand-up comedy 12 years ago. Back then, I was a bachelor who didn't know how to cook. All I knew was how to make sandwiches and as a bachelor, you don't even have the ingredients to make a good sandwich. Anything you find in the house, you'll put it between bread and call it sandwich, okay? Like chicken, banana, bread, sandwich, okay? Pineapple, cheese, there is no bread. One more pineapple, sandwich, okay? And people eat my <laughs> sandwiches and they'll say, wow, Naveen, your sandwiches are really something, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, I guess this is my gifting. I honestly thought this is my calling. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to start writing sandwich recipes right now so I can open a sandwich shop after college. Thank God for stand-up comedy. Otherwise, I'll have started a sandwich shop in Coimbatore by now, all right? So I started writing these sandwich recipes on my question paper. You're not supposed to write anything on your question paper, but I'm full on. I'm motivated now. You can't stop me, all right? So I'm like chicken plus banana, pineapple plus cheese. Sometimes I wasn't sure, so I'll be like brinjal, you know? So exactly at that time, the external invigilators come inside. You know the external invigilators, these are the people who can't sleep at night without accusing innocent children of copying, right? So, they come inside and I'm looking at my question paper and thinking, should I hide it? But if I hide it, he'll ask me, where's the question paper? I can't do anything, I'm helpless now. So then, as he comes near my question paper, you can see there's something written on it. Happiest day of his life, he thinks he's caught some kid. The biggest cheater in the world and I'm looking at him like, ah, you have no idea what you're in for. And he takes my question paper, he's like, <laughs> chicken plus banana. What? This is a hotel management student. What am I doing over here? <laughs> he thinks, let me read the question. What is this a question? Maybe there's an answer to a question. He reads a question. Define a contract of guaranteed chicken plus banana. And he's looking at me like, why? And he can't even ask me anything because the whole class will get distracted. So we're just staring at each other. He's like, what is this? What is this? I'm like, sir, I just want to be a bird, sir. <laughs> so, it's a true story though. I don't make this up. I don't make these things up. So um, I just want to let you know. Fortunately though, stand-up comedy started becoming a thing in the last two years of my college. I started doing it. And uh, here's a picture of me doing stand-up in my college formals. That's my college, what I was wearing to college. And I would do stand-up in the evenings. And so I was able to expand my energy like that, my creative energy that way. And uh, I started doing stand-up. And after uh, I finished law college, I started doing these YouTube videos with my friends, you know. And our whole goal was to one day make movies and TV shows. And I was doing stand-up along with all of those things. And back then, my intentions were pretty kind of pure. You know, it wasn't like some great big success. My intention was to one day just make comedy movies and TV shows with heart in it. You know, I saw a lot of these commercial TV shows and all like these formulaic comedies and you could always see the joke coming and I'm like, man, everything's so manufactured. 
I want to make a TV show and I want to make a show with heart, my heart in it so that people can see the voice of the creator in it. You know, that was kind of a noble intention. I realize, you know, when you're starting off, you might have honorable intentions. When you've tasted some of that success, you know, it starts getting skewed, right? So, um, within just a few years, even though we had less than 5,000 subscribers, somebody came along and they gave us this huge budget for like a show about an NGO. We made a show about an NGO. I know a lot of people here have started NGOs. I made a show about an NGO, so that's my contribution to the social sector. All right. <laughs> I played the head of an NGO and, and there was a show that came out and it had a lot of heart in it. I was like, wow, that dream got achieved pretty quickly. I got to make a show of my dreams with my heart in it. I got to act in it or write in it. That's pretty cool. So then what next? Now that that dream came along pretty quick. So then we started getting opportunities to write more shows. We wrote more and more shows and we started getting more recognition and um, well, it turns out it just wasn't really enough you know once you get more shows more recognition you get the money as well you get this thing called fame which was not really what i was pursuing i wasn't really pursuing fame you know i wasn't trying to be famous i was just trying to get to the top of this ladder whatever this ladder is i want to get to the top then i'll calm down you know i don't know what i was trying to prove to whom but i was trying to prove something to someone i don't know what it was because as we were getting the recognition and all of that stuff i thought okay what am I supposed to aim for now? What am, I, what am I aiming for? So then I thought, well, maybe the top of this ladder probably looks like this and Oscar. So I started thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aim towards an Oscar. And let me tell you, it's not like I wasn't praying. I was a Justin Case Christian at this time. I don't know if anyone here is a Justin Case Christian. You're a Christian because Justin Case, Jesus is the one true God. I'll go to church every Sunday. I was kind of a Justin Case Christian. And so I was praying for whatever I wanted, whatever I thought that I needed. So I was praying for one Oscar. Before I even got one Oscar, I decided, you know what? One Oscar is not enough. Uh, I need two Oscars. Then I will slow down. And I was working so hard. I was taking a toll on my relationships, on the time with my family. And I think I became sort of a slave to my own ambition. You know, I think the corporate world, they call it being a workaholic. I don't know if that's the same thing, but I was a slave to my own ambition. I just wouldn't stop. People would say, hey, Navin, when are you going to get married? I'm like, I got to get some stuff done. Like, as if I have to wash the clothes, but in my head, I'm like, the stuff done was two Oscars. All right? I'm like, I've got to get some stuff done. Then I'll think about getting married. I was just running towards this thing, seeking the validation of my heroes, just not finding any peace. And then I got saved in April of 2020. As people here are watching on YouTube and you're like, you got saved from what, dude? What, what are you, drowning or something? What are you, did you get kidnapped? What do you get saved from? <laughs> I, I got saved from my sins, to be honest. Now you're probably thinking, sins? Are you, what, are you, what are you, drowning people or something? <laughs> do you go around kidnapping people? What kind of sin did you commit, dude? And I got saved from my sin the same way that everyone here needs to get saved from their sin. Whether it's lying for your own selfish ambition, some lie that you say, you know, or whether it's lusting after a woman and checking them out, saying, hey, everybody checks out women, but then if somebody looked at the woman you loved, you'd have a problem, be like, how can you look at my woman? And they'd be like, oh, you also, you only said it's okay to check out women. So it's all this hypocrisy and lies, you know, or whatever it is, it could even be stealing from someone, whether stealing right off their body, something they had, or just selling them something they didn't need. Like, just some salesman who's going around selling things they don't need just so that you can make more of profit. Whatever it is, you know, if you're lying and if there's no honesty in you, then you're sinning in some way or another. I needed to be saved from that. And, um, and I, met, I met Jesus there in my house in Bombay. That's a long testimony, but it, it flipped me. It just flipped me out. It flipped my motivations. I suddenly knew that God was real. And I was faced with this choice, I remember sitting there in my bed, I was thinking, man, am I going to choose God? I thought I knew God, I didn't really know God till that moment when I was like, man, if I take this step and I'm like, okay, I have to do everything according to the Bible, that sounds scary. But if it's true, then I have to do it. And if you've never given your life to God, I can tell you it might be scary, but it should be obvious. 
It's scary because once you choose this path, you don't know what's on the other side, right? If you say no to God, then it's not that scary because, well, you go on, your life goes on the same way that it's been going on all this time. So it doesn't sound scary. It sounds scary because you don't know what's on the other side of saying yes to God. But one thing's for sure, it's going to be right. And I was sitting there and I'm like, I don't know what's on the other side of saying, but I'm not going to say no to God because that's stupid. You can't go wrong with God. You know, will life get easier? I don't know about that, but it's still got to be the right decision, right? So I said yes to God. And then suddenly, I had new motivations, all right? And to be honest, my new motivations were not at all my old motivations. In fact, I lost all motivation to do stand-up comedy. I lost all motivation to make movies or anything in the entertainment industry, to be honest. I just, I didn't see any point in it because up until that time, the only reason I was doing it was for myself. And I realized, well, none of that matters. None of that matters when you die, when you face God, when you enter into eternity, none of that matters. So what am I working for? So I lost all the motivation to do stand-up comedy. I didn't, it's not like I stopped being funny. I'm just like, I'm not going to pursue this career because there are people who are dying who need God. And that's my only purpose, right? But uh, slowly God nudged me back into doing stand-up. It took a lot of nudging because I did not want to go that way. It's not easy writing jokes. People may say, now we need to just justify it. You're really inside, deep down. You just want to do stand-up comedy. Listen, I'll grow onions <laughs> if I have to. I don't care. If God is with me when I'm growing onions, that's much more fun than doing stand-up comedy without God, I realize. That's not, it's not like I really want to do stand-up. But then when I was asking God, like, God, if you really want me to do stand-up, you know, you got to give me some, give me a word, you know. And one time when I was reading the Bible, or somehow I remember this one verse stood out to me. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And that same verse stood out to me the other, later in that night. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And I am no Jesus to stand on a stage and have compassion on my... I need compassion just as much as anyone else. But that verse suddenly made me feel this love for this audience. Not the same kind of love that comedians say, Love you, Bangalore! You know, not like that. You know, we... Usually artists would be like, oh, I love you, Jaipur, see you next year. Not like that. Suddenly, I felt this love for this audience. And I'm like, man, I, I really love these people. I love the young people who come to my show. How am I going to stay in touch with them? How am I going to keep in contact with them? I got to continue doing stand-up if I'm going to continue meeting them and my friends who are in this industry who I, who I seriously love. Then I have to get back to writing jokes. So... Um, that's how I got back into doing stand-up. Um, and then I had to write a new stand-up special in the last few months. And God helped me to do that sitting in the middle of nowhere in Kerala. Usually you have to do these things sitting uh, in a city and going to open mics and trying out new jokes every time. I didn't have the, this liberty when I was sitting in Kerala, you know. But within a few weeks, God helped me to write a whole one-hour special and go on tour with it. And the, the difference is that... Uh, this time, I didn't have the need to impress anyone with my comedy. I wasn't trying to impress my peers or try to give the audience what they want. I was like, I want to give them their money's worth and more, but I'm not trying to impress anybody up there. And suddenly, that gives you this freedom to write. As a creative artist, it gives you the freedom to write when you're not thinking about what other people are going to think. And um, lastly, I'll just talk about validation. Earlier, I told you I was trying to aim for the Oscars and the people up there, right? The people in the, in the movie industry, and I was aiming towards them. But suddenly, when you meet with God, everything else looks small. Once you meet the God who made the universe, let me just break it down, because sometimes you take, take that for granted. Once you meet the God who designed black holes and dolphins and air and photosynthesis, Everything else looks insignificant. If you just met the person who designed air, okay, it's transparent. It can carry water vapor, it can carry sound, all right, I can breathe in it. It's not too dense that you can walk through it. It's amazing engineering. If you just met the person who made air, you'd be showing off about it all the time. You'd be like, yeah, I was just hanging out with the person who made air yesterday, actually. Yeah, you should meet him. Yeah, it's pretty cool. People wonder, Naveen, why do you keep talking about God? Why do you keep talking about God all the time? Yeah, because he's awesome. <laughs> what do you expect? Right? So please meet with God. Um, uh, I don't think I have much time, but I eventually did go on to um, travel with my stand-up show. 
and I was worried about numbers. I was thinking always like, man, I need to sell out the show. I need to sell out the show. This is the point I really want to make. My time's up. Is that when I prayed and I asked God, God, help me to sell out every show because you have to show the world what a great God of victory you are and what a great, you know, every battle is a victory. Let's sell out every ticket and show. I didn't find any peace in that prayer. Because I realized if I'm trying to bring people to Jesus and if they think Jesus is all about selling out shows, that's not what Jesus came on earth to do. Jesus came to save us from our sins. All right. So if someone thinks that, oh, if I follow Jesus, even I can sell out shows. Nope. Oh, I follow Jesus, everything will go right. Nope. Jesus may give you the career or he may remove the career from you if that's what's causing you to sin. That's not the reason he came. He came to save us from our sins. And when I started praying, I said, God, even if we don't sell out any show, that's fine. If things go wrong and the stage falls down, that's fine. But you give me the grace to handle it well when I'm on stage so that people can see that you are with me and that grace and the inner peace that, that you've spoken about. And then I had peace and we sold out almost all the shows as well. So uh, I'll leave you with that. Just ask you guys, what is your motivation? You know, be clear about that. What is your motivation? To serve God, to serve man. Let it be to serve God. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I think it's wonderful meeting you, Naveen. Wonderful seeing this other side that we don't get to see. I must confess, I'm a little jealous of you because my wife likes your jokes more than mine. So I am dealing with that. I'm not there yet, but I'm dealing with it. And uh, uh, I think it's, it's really wonderful. Like, if we were to meet Naveen today, if you take a photo with him, you'll want to share it with people. How much more when we meet God, how much more should we want to share his love with others? And so we'd like to present a memento to Naveen. Uh, I request Pramod and Sheila to come. We, let's give a round of applause to this wonderful, amazing person. We, we know how God takes a fisherman and makes them a fishers of men. And here we have someone who's a stand-up comedian and God's taken up him to be a stand-up believer. So ladies and gentlemen, Naveen Richard for you.